For many years, people have been seeking out psychic mediums. Some perhaps want to know their future, and others just want to hear from a deceased loved one. Of course, some of the information that they get can be inaccurate, but other times it can be spot on. I've met a lot of psychic mediums that are just born with these abilities. Others may have had a profound experience, and like a light switch, their abilities were just turned on. And then others simply made a conscious effort to develop these abilities by doing the work. Now, over the course of my research, I've come to the conclusion that we all have these abilities deep within each of us. Some are more advanced than others, but most of us receive at least hunches or gut feelings. But recently I've noticed an interesting shift where everyday people are learning to connect directly with spirit. Some may want to connect with the deceased, guides, angels, source, or even God. Now, at first I thought they wanted to open up an office, get into the business, and do this for a living. But as I dug deeper, I found out that was not the main reason. A good majority of them simply wanted to connect directly with spirit. Now, a great friend of mine, Suzanne Wilson, happens to be a psychic medium, has been teaching everyday people how to develop these abilities. Of course, I was intrigued and I wanted to find out what they were doing. In this episode, I'm going to sit down with student mediums and ask them what they're doing to develop these abilities. So join me while I explore this new phenomenon that I would like to call F. PMs, first person mediumship. So growing up, did you ever get any psychic feelings or any type of I had feelings all along different things but I had an experience when I was 12 with the divine that really kind of pushed me forward and I was always fascinated even as a young girl with um, angels God anything supernatural or metaphysical but when I was 12 years old I was having a hard time on antidepressants uh, and I was at a point where at one time I thought I could take these pills and I could go sit in the closet and no one would find me by the time. So I was in that spot and all of a sudden uh, there wasn't a ceiling in the room. Sorry. It just disappeared. It just disappeared. And a light came in the room and filled the room and I heard you're not alone, you're, you've never been alone, and you're so very loved. And then it went Phew! away. Wow. Yeah. So I had a traditional upbringing of uh, church and Sunday school and Bible school and everything, and always was fascinated with that. But I always knew that there was something more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have little experiences along the way, things I would know mm -hmm. that I shouldn't know. At first, I thought that they were just happening around me. And then I realized they were happening to me because mm -hmm. of me. But as raising children and having busy as a mother and that, you, you pick, you know, you have these things come through. It is frustrating. I didn't know how to control it. Like, how do I know that this is going to happen? But I didn't see this. You know, it's like, what, what's, how, what's that about? It was more for me connecting with God. Growing up, did you have any psychic things happening? Did you see ghosts? Did you? I did not see ghosts. I had one instance when I was about 13. I remember looking in the mirror and I think I was like going to pop a pimple and I heard, and I say this not hearing objectively, but I heard sort of in, in, my, in my ear, in my head, um, I heard a woman's voice, an older British woman. And I don't even remember what she said, but I remember hearing a voice and I literally stopped mid popping pimple and I, it was almost like someone had smacked me and I went like this, no, 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 go away, go away, go away. And I thought either I'm losing my mind. I mean, I was 13 or maybe I'm mentally ill, but I don't know what this voice is, but I do not want to hear that. And then I thought, okay, maybe this is what they call your subconscious talking to you. Except my subconscious doesn't typically talk. Or schizophrenia. Talk. Yeah, well, that too. Um, <laughs> And it was very brief, and I thought, well, I don't, you know, British accent, I don't know where that comes from. Although I do do a mean British accent. I can do an imitation, but... Um, well, because you lived there before. Yeah. Well, it's in some other life, I guess. But I, I, I shut it down real quickly. And that was the last um, 
that I had heard anything, and I have I had not seen. How old anything. were you? At that? I was thirteen. Thirteen, mm-hmm. and then what was the next time you started to see or hear? I would know things. Oh, is is okay. more like it? For example, well, I I I saw my husband before I met him. I saw him in sort of a dreamlike vision when I was 23. I was dating another guy. I was not happy. And I mean, I literally saw him and he was sitting on bleachers and he said, wait, it's not our time yet. I was walking towards him. Did you tell him about the story? I waited a year after we were married. Yeah, because it's a little weird. (laughs) It's very weird. It's not just a little weird. (laughs) Trying to get inside your head as to Mm -hmm. why you wanted to to, uh, perfect this or learn this ability. Did you ever want to uh, connect with a loved one or? I didn't intend to do anything with those things that were happening. I didn't say, oh, I'm going to practice. I want to become a medium and an intuitive. That was never an intent of mine. Growing up, did you feel or have anything happen? Like, did you see ghosts? Did you have any, anything like that? Any I've psych- seen spirit and angels since I can remember. So I would say my most vivid memory is 18 months. And before that, I'm sure I did. But my vivid early memory is about 18 months of seeing and talking to So you're talking, you're talking about when you're 18 months old? Yes. Yeah, and it's only flashes from that stage, but forward from there, pretty regular. Uh, let's take into consideration that you wanted to develop your psychic awareness, your mediumship, to even more of an advanced state. Is that right? I did. Okay. What did you, did you want to connect with a loved one or what was the purpose of this? I was a counselor. I was the director of mental health for the county I live in, in central Arizona. And so I was already doing a lot of uh, crisis counseling and helping people, a lot of them who were grieving and I'm a very compassionate person. And I realized that if I took my skill and developed it to the point of being able to use it professionally, that that would help people with their grieving to come get closure and peace more than anything I could ever say. So did, and it does. did you have do you, do you have a training to do this? Uh... I have a I have a degree in in psychology and I worked at a psychiatric hospital and then in really? another facility and then director of mental health for the county. I've asked uh, a few psychologists about simple things like God, and it just doesn't fit into their academia. So what, what did you find about <laughs> the differences between academia, psych- science, and now you're combining the two of them? So right. obviously you saw. I saw a lot and it didn't match with what I knew to be true. Mm. And so all but one psychiatrist that I worked with and worked for me felt that if you see or hear things that other people don't, you need to be on medication for psychosis and you, then you might need to be hospitalized and there were quite a few people in the mental health program at that psychiatric hospital that all that was wrong with them was they were mediums. You made a, a conscious choice to say, I want to learn mm-hmm. how to become a psychic medium or a psychic. Mm-hmm. What really triggered me into pursuing studying mediumship was uh, the death of my son, unexpected. The day that Matthew was supposed to come up, he, he you know, he wasn't at the house on time and I get a phone call and it was police detective and they said "Uh, are you so-and-so yes is your son so-and-so yes you know and then your heart just oh they don't call you if they got picked up for whatever they call you when it's bad news yes it was bad news he had been taking his dog to the dog park in residential area here in Phoenix and was crossing the street and a car hit him Boom, end of, end of story. That first night, you know, after they had called me, and I'm sitting at the table waiting for relatives to show up, I was sitting there thinking, you know what, Matt? We had this big conversation the other day, last time you were here, and we had this great conversation where I just bared my soul to you, which after he had left that day, I thought, wow, we've never had that deep a conversation. We were sharing where we were in our journey, and he had started... It was all out of place. Out of place. He had started reading spiritual books. I mean, there was just... I was kind of impressed with this progress he had been making because he'd had an interesting life. Yeah. Never really settled and married and whatever. Make me a promise. You know, I will probably die before you, but in case something else happens, 
you need to come and tell me. If you die before me, you need to come and tell me. And if I die, I will come and tell you. We, you know, we made that agreement. We just bared everything, and it felt good when he left. And how, how, oh, how goodness. this was just before he passed? This was on a Saturday, and he died on a Tuesday night. Here I am, after I got this call on Wednesday with the news, and I'm sitting there at the table waiting for family, and I'm thinking of that conversation. It pops up, and I'm like, Matt, we had this conversation Saturday, remember? And I said, if you pass over, you need to give me a sign, and if I do, I'll give you a sign. You didn't give me a sign. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then the memory goes, Psh. He did give me a sign. I didn't recognize the sign. We were in the house. My husband's dementia. He's in and out. He's, he's seeing things. He's hallucinating off and on. Uh, we're watching TV. And I'm kind of bored. And I'm sitting there like, oh, this is really boring. You know, I wish they'd just get going. And suddenly I saw something over here, this far away. And it was little sparkling lights, this far away. Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. This 20, 30 inches away from it's, me. Yeah, and I kind of looked at it, and I'm like, what the heck? And they were just there for a few seconds, and I'm like, well, that was weird. You told me to. Okay, but see, I, I don't know what's going on in his life. I'm just like, what are these lights? All right, I kind of look back at the TV, and I'm like, hmm. Now they're in front of my husband. Oh, my God, he came. And that, Craig, is what helped me make it through the next few days, weeks, months. That was the defining moment of yeah. I did not fall apart. I did not have the luxury nor the need to hide in my room and cry for, for days on end to just dissolve. It was like, oh, my life, I'm dealing with the husband. I'm dealing with this, this, this. What's going on? No, it's like life continues. I am now convinced because my son came and told me. I personally didn't, I mean, I had a great imagination. I could see spirit as a young kid. And then I kind of, there was a point where I shut it down. How old were you when you just said, I got to shut this down? This Probably is... about getting into teenage years, like about 12. Yeah. And that's when it kind of really ramps up. And I, I just wanted to be normal. Because it could be really distracting. And you didn't really even know how to shut it off. You weren't properly trained. Not anything. at that point. So then what opened it up? I mean, did you want to connect with a loved one? I think it was always there, and looking back, I kind of wish that I had journaled. Suzanne always tells us to journal, and I wish I had because I went through periods of time where I know I did astral travel, and then it would go away, and then again. So, and chunks of time, like for months at a time, a couple years at a time, but as I got into my career. I had two kids close together, and then I had a third kid, so I just got busy with that life. Sure. And I kind of shut that part down. Yeah. But it was always there, but I just didn't really do anything with it. And also, the career that I was in, it wasn't really, <laughs> really um, accepted. No. So I was busy designing things, and I wouldn't really want to say, oh yeah, I can see so-and-so, but there was signs there. I mean, one time I was working on a computer really late at night and I heard, I could hear my name being called hmm. and I heard footsteps behind me and I know there was a security guard and I'm looking all around and I knew it was my dad in spirit just making sure I was okay in this big building that I was designing at late at night. And so it's always been with me. Um, I hadn't used it at that point, but at certain times I did. So did you ever want, you know, some answers that pertain to your life? Questions, divine questions, answers? Ironically, when I was younger, I'm not sure why I didn't tap into it. Because it would have been really nice to have guidance. Yeah. Like I have guidance now. So now let's describe the different ways that people can sense things from spirit. Some people can see things, and this could be shadows, apparitions, mists, or even lights. And then there are people that have the ability to hear things. This could be voices, music, or any kind of sounds. Some can feel things around them that aren't there. Some ask a question and get a knowing, like it's an answer. Some can smell certain odors that aren't present in the environment that they're in. 
And then there are some that can touch an object, get information, like an old pocket watch, they can sense that history. Then there are some people that receive taste. This could be food, chemicals, or even blood. This is what they call the clairs. Describe to me some of your students, the different clairs that they have. There are some teachers who say it doesn't really matter if you work with your power centers in the physical body or not. And I submit to you, why not use every tool that you have in the toolbox? The more that you understand that you have everything you need right here inside the body to be an intuitive person, the more intuition you can have in your life. So which of the uh, clairs seems to describe your ability? I, I think my most dominant is the clairsentient of the just knowing. Now I have a little of the others will come and go, uh -huh. but as far as the dominant would be of the just knowing. Sometimes in the past I have heard things, voices, music, mm -hmm. and I have seen things, um, but it's rare. Mostly it's just a knowing for me. And it's like when I try to, when I connect and get information, it's like a memory that's not mine. Oh, it comes out of the blue. It doesn't, yes. It doesn't reflect your life. You, I'm and like, that, that usually gives you the confirmation yeah, that it's... This is not, like, where, where did that come from? This yeah. is not mine. And it feels like you're daydreaming or you're remembering a memory that isn't yours. Um, I had a young man in spirit, the son of my, my children's school director. Okay, the director of my kid's school lost her son. From a local high school, he was 18 coming home on a fall break trip, and he was killed in a car accident. Six months after he passed, she called me into the, the office at the school, and I mean, we were friendly, but you know, it wasn't like we were super tight, and she said, shut the door, and she told me that she had been seeing a medium. She said, did you know that? I said, no. She said, okay, well, this medium knew things about him that there's no way she could have known. And I still said, okay, I had no idea why I was there. And she says, the way she works is she writes things down on, on paper that she gets from spirit, okay? She pulls out a, a piece of yellow legal pad and she said, he gave her your name. It was the name Deb. So th this is what okay. I said. So it was circled and I said, okay, that could be any Deb. She said, oh no, it's not, it's you. And she was very sure. Now, this is a woman that had just lost her son six months ago. Who was I to say, well, he, your son's wrong. She was very committed to knowing this. And I said, um, I said, it could be any Deb. She said, I don't know any other Debs. And he said, it's the Deb from school. And our school was about 90 children. There were no other. And I wanted to be respectful. I was so freaked out. I thought, why is this young man in spirit giving her my name, am I gonna die? My sister had had cancer several times, is something gonna happen to my sister? I was freaked out. Yeah. I was totally freaked out. And it turns out her son, oh I have the chills when I talk about this, um, he came to me a little later on um, when I was doing yoga in Shavasana. So I didn't choose this, I didn't choose to perfect this. It's hard to explain when there's just this knowing everything all of a sudden made sense to me. And so, no, I did not set out, I did not say, I'm going to become a medium and I'm going to do readings and I'm gonna hang a sign on my door and charge people. Exactly. I was then getting almost downloads for people that I knew and there was no way that I could know the information that I was being given. I knew I wasn't crazy, I'd been in therapy long enough to know I, I was not crazy. I could not know these things. And the fact that the messages that I was giving to these people was giving them hope and healing. So we talk about the clairs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, seeing, hearing, feeling, knowing, which one, or all, or I have all of those, some more strong than others. So you'll hear voices, you'll, well, that's definitely psychosis. <laughs> <laughs> I hear voices, I see you need things, a rubber I'm room fully now. admitting it, yes. Get the straight jacket out. <laughs> so you would get all the clairs? Yes. I think the first one would be the clair cognizance. You know, it's like, when I'm doing a, a reading for somebody, or just intuition, it's like I just kind of know. Yeah. This is like 
it's almost like these thoughts or an image or something that just pop in my head and I just kind of know right. what's happening or who this is. Sometimes we'll hear a name or a song. And so in my head, I'm talking to the spirit. It's like, you know, well, give me some information and well, what did you do or, you know, what things, what were your hobbies or show me a scene and it'll just sort of pop into the head. Is it something I'm actually seeing, seeing? I'm not seeing the spirit next to them, but it's in my head, this, this stuff. Right. So I think it's like a clear cognizance. I've had a little bit of the, where you're, you're smelling. I've done three different platform demonstrations, you know, as, as a student, and you're scared to death when you get up there. But all of a sudden, stuff starts popping in, and they'll show you things, and you just go, okay, I got... I'm seeing they're setting a table and there's this beautiful terrine and it's got like soup in it and it's got, I see this green, like it's an Irish, whatever, Lennox, where, oh, that's what my grandmother had. Well, that's who I was connecting with. Can you describe your Claire? I don't have one main one that I use. They all depend on what I need. So you could get a fragrance, you could get picture, you could hear a voice, you get them all. And sensation, feeling. Knowing. Feel how they, knowing definitely. My saying my whole life is I know what I know. I've said that since a little kid. What's important is to sense energy. However that comes to you, whether you see it, hear it, feel it, smell it, taste it, you figure out what's working for you right now and you leverage that. So let's say your clairvoyance is really strong. You get flashes of like, almost like daydream images that come into your mind. Um, I see that my plane's gonna be late. I have, I have a, a, just a real quick image that there's a bunch of people lined up waiting and it says the plane is delayed. Well, it came in very calm, it came in very clear. I wasn't thinking about it. I'm gonna check it out. Guess what? I just went online, it's delayed. Okay, well, why couldn't I have gotten that clairaudiently? Why couldn't I have just heard the words, your plane is being delayed? I want to get it that way because my friend in my class gets a lot of stuff that way or whatever. Okay. It's a comparison thing. Mm -hmm. Mark Twain said comparison is the death of joy, right? Don't compare. Well, a lot of people would be happy to get that insight no matter what so they don't get to the airport three hours too early. But what happens with students is they're not satisfied. Their satisfaction in their development is a moving target. I'll be happy when I get this. I'll be happy when I get that. And happiness is outcome dependent. So what I try to do is change the whole framework for them of let's celebrate that you got this clairvoyantly. Give gratitude for that. Put it in your journal and say, you know, at some point in the future, spiritual team, I would love to work on getting things clairaudiently. Let's remember that and just put it out there. Your abilities are going to unfold in the time and in the manner that are just right for you, but it helps to tell your team what you're interested in doing so they can get behind it and support it. You know, I've often heard from some of the mediums and psychics that I've interviewed that there's the energy match needs to be there with the sitter, the subject that they're doing the read with. Is, do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I, I think you still could get information. Uh -huh. uh, my information comes prior. Usually once I set the intention of the reading, I start, it just starts coming and I write it down. Mm -hmm. But then once I connect with the sitter, it does go tremendously better when there's an energy match, when that person is open and happy and enjoying it the flow you can you can feel it start to flow so yeah. what do you do when you sense that the sitter is just closed tight-lipped i try to lighten things up mm -hmm. and and where you can kind of feel their personality so i try to match with that and know how to lighten them up you know and be like so you you do some lightening for them yes not just a verbal joke or some right. type of joke and nice. just try to to match that because when you have someone that's enjoying it and their vibration is higher and they're not, you know, the, the reading, not that you won't get information because I, I usually always do, but it, it is amazing, the difference. What do you think about this match, this energy match? Well, I have actually had some experience with that because when I'm 
with somebody or reading for somebody, I always get at least something. And mm -hmm. at one particular point, it was so weird because I got nothing, just a blank screen. Mm -hmm. And then in, the person said that they they were going to put up a, a wall not to receive any messages. You heard, you heard this? No, they physically told me that. The oh. Person. So okay. it is an energy match because there was no energy exchange or match because the person had shut it down prior to. A reading is a triadic experience, meaning it is the medium or the intuitive, the sitter or client, and the spirit person. Okay. And that means there are three energies involved here. And not all readings are created equal. One medium may sit with the sitter and say, gosh, nothing seemed to resonate for them. It didn't work. And then the very next day, they can go to another medium. And there's maybe similar life experiences, or they just seem to vibe better. And all of a sudden, it's on. Yeah. And so the important thing is to not find any fault with yourself if you're the medium or find any fault with yourself if you're the sitter. It could just be there really wasn't an energy match or a good vibe that okay. just, you know, you could ride that energy wave. Or it could also just mean the spirit people weren't ready at that time or that wasn't the right day. That's, a, but, that's good to know because mm -hmm. I think it, it kind of ties in with the trust. You could lose your confidence yeah. and you just go, whoa, just... Sometimes it's just not that energy match that you had discussed. About 90% of the students that I work with, they really only want to do this to make their own direct connection with their own beloved people and pets and spirit, their own spirit guides. And then there's this 10% that thinks they want to do this professionally. Mm -hmm. However, I make sure that all of my mediumship students get the opportunity to practice tuning in yeah. and doing the readings. Why? Because the more that you get, all of that experience has a cumulative effect. It all adds up. Right. And if you put yourself in the sitter's shoes and now you're the medium giving the reading, it not only gives you practice tuning in to a different vibration with the spirit world of people you don't even know, but also gives you even greater empathy for the medium because now you're on the spot. Can you describe to me what you did to make your meditation effective? Like what did you do to, to really get your med meditation? I think it's um, it was a little practice and it was a lot of reassurance. Um, things from Suzanne and things I'd read like, just because a thought comes in, it's not your meditation isn't ruined. Let it let it go on past. Acknowledge it, and you know, like, oh, I'm going to connect with God. Is that the neighbor's dog barking? You know, it doesn't mean you've ruined it. Just yep, that was the neighbor's dog barking. Let it mo let it go on by. So don't fuss with it. No, just just sit with it. Let it. And mine is is um. I feel that channel of energy, and my head starts to tingle. Um, and I can feel I'm connecting. So uh, you just you just sit with it. You just empty your mind and wait. So when you're meditating, you said your head tingles? When I meditate or I do a reading or connect with spirit at all, my head starts to tingle and my ears get a little... Low. When spirit gets close, my ears do a little... Low. Like, like if you have the window down a little, that noise. Pressure static? Yes. Okay. So can you describe to me what you did to make an effective meditation? Meditation is definitely a practice and there's a reason they call it that. And it, it probably took me, I started meditating before I really knew about my gifts um, because a therapist had suggested meditation for me because I was so high strung and, and anxiety ridden. And I started with guided meditations. And I found that I really enjoyed them. I was able to, I'm a good visualizer obviously, I guess. And um, so I was able to listen and sort of follow along in my mind's eye with, with what the guided meditation was. Um, and that was several years worth. And then it's funny because when this process began, my development, um, 
I would do a, an opening third eye meditation and I would do a, um, you know, I'd, lis I'd listen to meditations to open your heart chakra and all this kind of stuff. And okay, I'm gonna listen to this. And my heart chakra, I felt like maybe it's just gonna, I'm gonna hear this like pop and my heart's gonna open. I, I didn't know what it was gonna be like, but um, I did that for, for a good year and a half. And I mean, dedicated. I would meditate sometimes three, three times a day and I have kids, but they'd be in school. I'd do one in the morning. I'd do one when they were in school and I'd do one before bed. But what really helped me was, um, was taking, uh, it was an online workshop about, it was called sitting in the power. And I thought, oh, this sounds so hokey sitting in the power. You know, what am I going to do? The beams of light are going to come down <laughs> and, but I'm open to anything. So I thought, okay, great. Um, and it was the best five week workshop for me because what I learned was sitting in the power, I was not meditating to connect with spirit or to open my pineal gland, you know, my third eye, I'm gonna do, oh, that was another one. I always did third eye uh, opening meditations. I was learning to sit in the silence, learning to connect with the power within my own soul. And my God, if you had told me, I would have said that four years ago and I would have thought that is the cheesiest thing to say. But it is so true and it is so necessary, whether you're in the healing profession or not. Um, when you learn to go inward and to sit and to just be and, <clears throat> excuse me, to really listen to what the soul has to say, you will be amazed. I have the chills again. You will be amazed by the answers that you're able to receive. And it's not, again, like I'm I'm being beamed from from source or the divine or God or what, however you look at it. Um, sometimes that can happen. But I was actually hearing my own soul speak to me. And that is the most powerful type of meditation. And how do you know it was your soul versus maybe a guide? How would you, how'd you know the difference? It's, it, it's very hard to articulate, but it's almost like when it's from my own soul, it literally feels like it comes from a place deep within. And when I'm hearing from guides or from source it the direction it's more and even though sort you know god is not in my mind not up it's it's everywhere when you're asking about how do i know that's how it works for me that it's more there's above and then it's it literally feels inward and down here so can you describe to me what you did to learn to have an effective med meditation <laughs> okay so i'm not a meditation person <laughs> Okay. But I'll tell you that I had a friend and she asked me for about one year to go to this Tuesday night meditation group. And I said no for a year. So I finally said, okay, I'm going to go for you. So I went to this meditation group, small group, six, eight people. The teacher was an angel voice. I mean, what she spoke, you're gone. So within a minute, I'm gone. And I'm traveling all over the place. I went to Thailand, even though I've never been to Thailand. And I go back week after week. And it got to the point where when I came out, everybody's like, where did you go? So <laughs> I'm not a meditation person, but I don't practice anything. And I just, it just innately or naturally took over me. And it was amazing. You know, that's interesting. That topic just came up yesterday with a student and I and they said, I have difficulty meditating. And I said, well, meditation is not always old fashioned, traditional meditation. A lot of things are meditation. And I realized years ago for me, when I play musical instruments, I'm in a meditative yes. state. You know, so I'm glad you said that because I, <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about. I, uh, I meditate in a very strange way. And my wife calls it nap time. Do you zone out? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I zone out. I, I I edit all day. I, I'm you know, you get fried. That's intense. It's it's focused. It's it, you burn on my circadian rhythms. You know, they just two o'clock. I'm like, I gotta go connect with my source. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody's got their own thing. Um. So how did you, how did you, how did you learn to 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 properly meditate where you were felt like you were connecting with. Well, I took yoga for a long time, and mm -hmm. I took meditation around the same time, and I felt both of them were equally meditative states for me. I had a spiritual teacher back in 94 who worked on me with intuitive skills, and we did more traditional meditation together, mm -hmm. and I felt like she really helped me with setting intention before you do meditation, which I think is the biggest it, yes, part of what I yeah. do now. You know, I only do it when I set intention for what I want to accomplish with that meditation. It works really good to use headphones 
because and some music because it blocks out all the other and you kind of go yeah. right inside. So the music has to be just right mm -hmm. too because that could almost be... It's very distracting if it's not. Right. You know, or I've tried some different meditations that even people's voice might be a little... Just doesn't... Yeah, you're starting to analyze their... Yeah, it doesn't resonate with you. It doesn't flow. So those things... So really background. Help. Yep. Background. And then not earbuds, but maybe a... Headphone. An ear... Yeah. Muff type. So that everything else is blocked, blocked out. Blocked out. So then it, it really kind of forces you to go right inside. Yeah. You know what I do is I take earbuds and then I have noise canceling headphones. Mm. And uh, I can't even hear my yeah. dog bark in the house. That's perfect. Yeah. That's That's how I like it too. And I sit in a, I have a meditation room in my house and I sit in there and it just. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the techniques that you did to quiet your mind? Because you sound like to me like mm -hmm. you're scattered all over the place how did you <laughs> i take offense to that <laughs> do you i no, i don't at all i just i have i have a lot i have a lot that goes on you're in the my one mind. that told me this <laughs> i do i have a lot that goes on in my mind but um but what's amazing is and that i mean if you want proof that meditation works that's when my friends are like well we have to start meditating if deb can do it anyone can do it because my mind is so busy and so active and so when i take that time for myself to get quiet for one, it's really learning to surrender and let go to everything. Again, this was also a lot learned in therapy. I cannot control everything. I can control myself and my own actions. I cannot control anyone else or anything else that happens in my life, right? Right. But I can control how I respond to things. I learned through therapy that worrying in anticipation of an event or being nervous about something or being freaking out, if you will, that's the term I usually like to use, about something has no effect on the outcome whatsoever. All it does is it makes me nuts and it makes the people around me nuts because I drive myself and everyone crazy. So that is really the first step, was, was learning that I can only control the things that I can and that starts with me. So do I want to walk around feeling calm and at peace and steady or do i want to walk around like you know i've had nine espressos you know every every second of the day and i i chose the former because i just felt better so when when i surrender and, and in this sitting in the power meditation it started with a little bit of guided meditation just more like prompts so you're sitting here it's all about your breathing the breath is everything because when you are simply focusing on a breath in and a breath out I'm not thinking about what am I going to make for dinner tonight. I have nine loads of laundry to do tomorrow. I am focusing simply on my breath. I am staying in the now. Okay. As I was learning more about the mediumship, it wasn't so much of wanting to connect with my guides or angels or loved ones. It was just wanting to open up to the universe, to calm my mind, to be able to call in what I needed to perhaps do a reading. So I have switched to... Um, one that Suzanne Wilson does called Synergy Peace, which works you through your chakras. And she starts out and talks about, okay, visualize, and here's your chakra, your, your root, and your sacral moves up. And you visualize that and then get to a point where it's sort of free style. You're just sort of whatever comes in, comes in. And that's what works for me to get ready, to really feel centered. Mm-hmm and prepare myself for whatever's going to come. And when those weird thoughts pop in my head, like, oh, what am I eating for dinner tonight? It's like, hey, wait, psh, that's not the time, go away. We call it the monkey mind, you know, where you're just thinking of everything you need to do, your to-do list, the conversation you just had or you need to have later on that day. And so the, the biggest thing that will help people to quiet down is don't beat yourself up. If you're trying to be quiet, if you're trying to tune in, and if a thought comes in, don't entertain it, don't try to push it away, and worst of all, don't go, darn it, I just can't meditate because a thought came in. That, that's just, it's done, game over. Instead of beating yourself up, just observe the thought. The thought came in, oh, and I teach them to just say, oh, thought, and mm. just let it pass through. Mm, I love that. Here's another one. Thought. Let it pass through. Thought. Oh, that one's kind of humorous. Okay. Little laugh. Human experience. Let it pass through. And when they do that enough, they find that they can, it's almost like they can put those thoughts aside in a box 
for the appropriate time to bring them back out. So in the beginning, did you have a hunch? Was it a feeling? You just know, like all of a sudden you just know. And then I also would hear, which once, I would also hear voices when I was going to sleep and waking up, I could hear conversations and stories that I knew were not mine. So you could hear people talking? Yes. So in the beginning, in the very mm -hmm. beginning, uh, can you describe your hunches, your feelings? You know, we all have sort of a gut instinct, um, mm -hmm. or the, the fight or flight. You know, if you, how can you describe when you're walking down a dark alley and you just feel someone behind you? <clears throat> you don't have to be a medium or an intuitive or to a psychic to know that, right? We all have that gut instinct. But it's almost like gut instinct taken to a slightly deeper level. It, it becomes almost this knowing. And, and you don't know how you know, right? You're just, it just feels like a knowing. So often then I would start to question, well, I, I don't know, is this my mind? Is this my imagination? And hunches and knowing, they, they would just sort of come. They would just sort of happen. But the biggest thing I have to say is when a hunch becomes a knowing is when you've learned to trust yourself. Because a hunch is always just going to be a hunch when you say, well, it might be this. Oh, no, no, I'm probably wrong. I, I'm second guessing and doubting. I don't do that anymore, which is so funny for the better part of my, for probably the past 43 years, I never trusted myself. I would need validation from everyone else until I was, okay, that makes sense to me now. I don't need anyone else to validate things for me because I do, I listen to my own soul and those hunches, <clears throat> excuse me, have become the knowing because of the trust. You said at age 18 months you were getting these uh, connections. Can you describe what your, you know, like what's the difference between a hunch or a feeling? Like how did you know that this isn't me, this is, it's not a hunch, I'm not just making that up. Well at that age I, I had no idea what psychic was and I don't remember having psychic flashes at that age. I remember seeing angels very clearly and they were talking to me and then and spirits and and I did not know at that time what that was but I know my mom was always like you she always used to say you had the most amazing imagination right from the beginning and I would be talking away and nobody was there and for them nobody was there but yeah. for me there what there was so you're having conversations with angels you're seeing angels and spirit and spirit and your mom's like I don't see this yeah they just thought they she was always like you have the most incredible imagination yes yeah. Imaginary friends. Imaginary and, friends. Yes. <laughs> but she allowed it. Well, she had, we had a lot of kids in the family, and my parents both worked a lot of hours, so they didn't have a lot of time or energy to worry about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was an easy kid. <laughs> Thank goodness. Because most parents would be like, you need to tell your little friends to go away <laughs> and get some real friends. What do you tell your students about how to act on their hunches or these feelings they get? I love hunches. I think some of the greatest things that have happened on earth have started with somebody having an idea, the big idea, the hunch, but life is really about all the little things that happen on a daily basis. If you have a hunch or a flash of an insight, evaluate it first. Did it come in very calm and very matter of fact? and spontaneous. I wasn't even thinking about that. But here's the thought. And I always use the Edgar Cayce litmus test about tuning in. Is the information helpful, hopeful, and healing? Which is another thing I teach my students. Is the information helpful, hopeful, and healing? So if it's coming in, there, it may come in with a good feeling, but not a hyper feeling. Then you can trust that. However, if the information comes in with panic, oh my God. I just had this thought, I wonder if, or if it comes in like, yippee, I feel like I'm gonna win the lottery today. Spirit wants me to go play the lottery. Oh. Those are extremes. And the true intuitive voice, your soul self, doesn't come in manic up here, and it doesn't come in with low vibrational, scary, bad, evil thoughts. It comes in right in the middle, in the center. And that's when you trust it. If it comes in with the panic or the fear, reevaluate because that may not be the true intuitive voice.
So what do you do to effectively get your rational mind out of the situation? So you're... It's trust. I sit quiet and I trust that spirit will bring that information. And I quiet... A lot of times, this is a really strange thing I do too, but I, I focus on the left side of my brain. I imagine in my head a point in the middle of my left side. Okay. And all of a sudden, I think my right side. Oh. And it clears everything away. And there that channel opens up. Speakers used to use a stone, something mm. to rub or a paper clip. So they... Distraction. Distraction to allow the... Because mm -hmm. it takes your rational mind and puts it here. Yeah. And the other comes in. And I will... And I, I do start writing. And once I start writing, then it really just comes. So I just... And I've learned that I don't have to trust myself. I just have to trust spirit. Yeah. So if you're trusting in angels and guides and God, mm -hmm. you're good. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> yeah, you know the informa yeah. information's going to Yeah, you're be good. not going to correct them or question it. It sounds to me like you started in therapy. Yeah. To, to better understand yourself. Absolutely. And get a grip on your... Get a grip on everything. On my anxiety for the yeah, most part. Yeah, your anxiety. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like that that set you up to understand this whole... Or was it... What was it? I do. I think, um, I mean, I started therapy when I was 23 and I'm almost 46. Um, and I haven't been in therapy, you know, every month for 23 years. Um, there were times I went to therapy to figure out how to deal with my anxiety, to figure out why I was such a control freak, to figure out why I had so many fears. Um, most fifth graders don't run into their parents' room crying in the middle of the night because they're afraid of nuclear war with the Russians. That was me. Uh, maybe I was eight, not ten. So um, I, I mean, I was a fearful kid, and and I don't know if um, if this was a part of my world then that that I just didn't really recognize. But I was I was a sensitive kid. I mean, I was an empath to the you know nth extreme. But what I find so interesting, um, and everyone has their own journey, and this is absolutely not to discount or discredit anyone else's. This is just my own. Um, I know I have friends that that I've met through this. Journey. Journey, thank you. Um, that also had anxiety from a young age, but they never dealt with it. So they had anxiety and then they started seeing spirit or, or hearing from spirit. And then they just started developing and they were practicing mediumship. But I've heard this a lot and nothing can be more true. When you're doing a reading and you're not getting evidence or you're not connecting to spirit in the way that you need, it is never the fault of spirit. Spirit People are intelligent beings, just like people in the physical. Um, they know how to connect. If if we're not getting something, it's I believe this, it's because of a blockage within ourselves. So what that says to me is if I'm not connecting, it's because there is something that maybe I haven't tapped into or maybe I haven't worked on within myself that's preventing me from understanding the spirit person's experience in life. And maybe right. I do. You, do you know what I'm saying? So I, it, yeah, it, no, I, I think I think it, I think with you, I think it had a lot to do with your progress. Yes, I, I think you were able to really fully understand yourself Absolutely. from a very I don't know clinical sense. Without a doubt. So now mm -hmm. you had that grounding, and mm -hmm. you were able to move forward. Yeah, I, I not only that, I what I learned over the past 20 or so years was to fully accept myself. People say, well, how do you trust yourself in a reading? How do you, that didn't come from developing my mediumship. That came from, from, and again, you don't have, I'm not pitching therapy by any means, but for me, it, it was therapy that worked. All the work that I did on myself um, was really about trust, was really about letting go of, of the shame I, I used food. Some people use alcohol. Some people use drugs. That was never my thing. I used food to numb my feelings when the anxiety would get so bad. Um, having ADHD and raising children, I, I literally would describe it as I was white knuckling through life. How did you learn how to get your rational mind out of the way? Just trust yourself. And so that's been really big for me. That's how I get my mind out. And every time it'll creep in and then I say, nope. Just be a channel and deliver what you get. So I would assume that some of the students have trouble getting their rational mind out of the way and letting the subconscious mind connect. How do you 
What do you tell them? To get your rational mind out of the way and just let your subconscious mind connect, you really want to trust. You really have to allow yourself to take the very first thing that comes in and notice the feeling or the emotion that comes with it. And if it seems clear, it's a very clear, spontaneous thought that just comes in, boom, 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 give it. If it's for yourself, write it down. Write down the date, write down the time. Here's the insight that came in. Here's how it came in. It seemed very clear and matter of fact. I believe I trust it. If you're doing a reading, give it right away. It's always when we correct ourselves or, or we, we second guess it. That's when the rational. That's the rational mind stepping up and saying, whoa, 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 wait. You don't want to risk being wrong here. You have to make sure and you have to, you know, and once you have that ego in there saying, you could be wrong. You could be wrong. Don't give it. You need at least 10 more signs before you can <laughs> accept that. Uh, you'll just be treading water and not getting anywhere, whether it's information for you or information for someone else. Many of us have had paranormal experiences at least one time or another in our lives. Do we acknowledge these phenomena or do we think it's simply our minds playing tricks on us? But either way, the experts all tend to agree that these could very well be spirits letting us know that they're around us. The students also talked about an energy match and how to bridge the gap to have a better read. I think if the energy match isn't there, it could deflate your confidence, which will directly affect the trust. The experts all seem to believe that meditation is a must, but as you have seen, it's the intention that's important. The students then talked about knowing the difference between a hunch and a gut feeling. They also discussed the importance of getting the rational mind out of the way. So what did you do to get more familiar with your guides? Again, I did a meditation. It was a little bit of, of shame that I had forgotten him because I remembered him. You remembered your guide mm -hmm. from when you were little? I think before I was here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, but that's okay. Yeah. You were It was explained to you that that's totally... Right. It was, be it was beautiful, but it, it, once I saw the guide, I remembered who he was in the meditation. And so... Is this uh, guide with you? Always. Al always. Mm -hmm. Randomly, he came, he came to you. I was doing a meditation. Or actually, I think I was doing... Were you it. asking to get... No, I, I, was not, I wasn't saying, are you my guide? Well, did you ever ask, hey, I want to I get acquainted with my guides? Was that ever on your head? No, it's really not. And I, I, maybe that's not the, the, the PC thing to say in, in this business, but... No, it, it's... You know, I, I don't put a ton of emphasis on that only because... I just feel grateful and I always thank my guides, my team and spirit, because I know I have one. I know of a couple, but I don't sort of line them up before a reading or I don't put a lot of focus. I just know that they're there and they've got my back, so to speak. And um, some people really utilize their guides more. Um, I always thank them for, for sort of helping lead me and guide me on my journey, but I don't put a ton of weight on them maybe because I think I know I'm not in this alone I couldn't do this alone I need to own this for myself and I don't say from an ego standpoint I need to own it I need to trust that that they're there whether I'm seeing them or whether I can tell you what clothing they're wearing or what their name is I know that they're there and I know that they have my back so knowing that I have to act accordingly and go through a reading or go through my daily life just knowing that they're there, but not constantly, well, what should I do now? What should I do now? And I, I know that they're there for me to ask when I struggle or when I stumble. But again, I'm really, for my own journey, I'm really looking to try to go within mm -hmm. and to get the wisdom from my own soul. So my son passed away and I felt surrounded by the other side. There were so many people from the other side around me and I knew I had a main guide. So I actually was a little bit bossy and I touched my head here and I said, my main guide, you need to touch me here so I know that you're here with me. Because I could feel all kinds of spirits from the other side and it was like a giant cushion. And so from then on now, when I really need to hone in, he will touch me here. How do you teach your 
students to be acquainted, to be introduced to their, to know that their spirit guides are they're there. How do you, what do you do to help them with this? One of my favorite things to do is to help students get to know their spirit guides. Each one of them has a team. You have a team. Everybody watching has their own team of beings who work behind the scenes. There's one guide that we believe from the afterlife literature and from the um, anecdotal data that we have from mediums over the last, I would say, 20 decades or so. We know that there's one guide. You can call this a main spirit guide, a master spirit guide, a guardian, whatever you want to call it. But one guide will stay with that soul on earth from birth to death. And then in between lives on the other sides, like they're the BFF, the best friend, like, wow, that was a wild ride. Or, you know, you, you did mostly good there. You did your best. And they'll talk to that guide on the other side about planning if they want to come back. But that guide will also coordinate the team. So there'll be other guides that oh. I say they come and go for a season or reason based on our needs. And I've started calling them subject matter expert guides, like relationship guides mm -hmm. that will come in. So how do you meet all these people? First off, you don't have to. The good news is you don't have to. But if you'll just want, say, hey, everybody, I know that I have a spiritual team. I want to thank you for what you're doing. They'll love it because they're the unsung heroes of the other side of life. They'll continue to do their thing, and you can just focus on receiving the signs and the symbols, those little freaky deaky coincidences called synchronicities that seem to point the way, and just focus on that. Now, what's happening lately is there is a huge groundswell of people coming forward saying, no, that's not enough for me. I want to know who these dudes are. Mm -hmm. I want to know about them. I want to know where they come from. I want to know what their intentions are. I want to know, have I been in them with past life before? Yeah. And so I'm like, whoa, 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 wait. Let's just do one thing at a time. Focus first on getting to know that one that is always with you. Because what they will do is they'll bring others forward to meet you. And set your intention um, my primary or master spirit guide, I'm looking forward to having a dialogue with you. Okay. I realize that you've had many incarnations on earth. That's how you got your expertise to be a guide. And so rather than asking them, hey, what's your name? You would ask, what name shall I call you? And I've been telling my students this for a dozen years. It confuses them when they say, what's your name? What's your name? Think about this. If you've had 40 or 50 lives on earth and wow. I ask you your name. I never thought about it like that. They're like, well, let's see. I was John, yes, Jack, Jerry. Thank you. Exactly. Plus, they're also thinking, oh, my poor person doesn't realize that names aren't important to us. Oh, how do I explain this? And then meanwhile, you're waiting for that big announcement of their name. So instead, just say, look, I have an intention. I want to get to know you. I want to dialogue with you. I want to check in with you more actively instead of passively. I want you up in front instead of only behind the scenes. So what name shall I call you? And you can sit and let them, you know, have a pen and paper, write one letter at a time, let it come in. And then at the end, check it and say, this is what I got. I'll give you a warning, though. You may have to buy a vowel. <laughs> like... <laughs> I have to say, sometimes they leave vowels out when they're, they get, they're really good at getting consonants through our heads, but, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, that game show where I'll buy a vowel. Yeah. But then double check it and say, look, here's what I got. Um, mine is Leo Roy. So I said one day, okay, so Leo Roy, I think you want me to call you Leo Roy. Is that right? And I could feel a very happy, uplifting feeling. Oh, he likes that name. Okay. Eventually it became LR. Leo Roy, I mean, he can't just be LeRoy um, or Leroy, he has to be Leo Roy. So I said, look, can I just call you LR? And I could see, in my mind's eye, I could see him go like this. So our guides perfectly understand that even though names are not important in their vibration, names are important to us for communication. I see. So now you got the name. How did you get past the, the, the not trusting part?
Like when you get an information, mm-hmm. you go, eh, how'd you get past that? The biggest thing for getting past questioning those kind of things is relinquishing the ego. A lot of not trusting is, oh gosh, why can't, why didn't I get that information? Why aren't I good enough? The That's all ego. There. Yeah. So what changed my mediumship? I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you the reading. I, I, I remember it because it was a reading I did for Suzanne's class. I let go. It has to do with me trusting, allowing, and surrendering. There's trust really that you're getting messages that are real. That trust only comes through doing enough readings and getting feedback from the people you read for telling you, I understand that. Yes, that makes sense to me, you know, or later figuring it out and letting you know what that was about. And then eventually I realized I could just let go and I didn't care if they don't connect right away. I don't expect them to connect sure. right away. Well, everybody's in their own time yeah. frames. So I just was able to let go of all that and stop a second guessing the information and trying to edit myself because you might edit out, I might edit out the one thing a person most needs to hear. How did you get past um, the not, not trusting your intuition? It took a while. It took a while for, you know, it's like, oh, I'm making this up. Oh, it's my imagination. It was a lot of Suzanne saying, just trust, just trust, just let go, just let flow. And eventually realizing that sometimes imagination really isn't the imagination. It is a story that's coming in from spirit. So how do you uh, get your students to learn how to trust? Trust comes with practice. There is no button that I can push for a student and say, your trust is on now. Good job. You're done. Go. It really starts with the journal, keeping a notebook of the signs, synchronicities, symbols, meaningful dreams, lucid dreams, astral travels, dream visits. And then you'll be able to look back and see patterns and trends in how you receive information. But also, my students start to develop their own dictionary of symbols. Like for example, uh, a red apple comes to my mind. For me, that always means teacher or It could mean red apple. My client just ate a red apple in the car before coming into the office. (laughs) So sometimes the symbols are literal and sometimes they're figurative. And I tell them, don't be afraid to be wrong because there's nothing worse than if you're doing a practice reading for someone. And again, a lot of these students, they're only doing this so they can learn how to make their own direct connection. They're not gonna be professional mediums. This is for everybody but you practice doing a reading, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say I'm doing a reading for you. I'm very, very nervous. I'm just a student. I don't want to be professional. And I tell them, let all that go. Pretend you're playing the part of the medium, your professional medium, and just let it go and trust that what comes in, you're just going to give it. And they're like, okay, I'm playing a part. I know I'm not really a medium, but I practice. And they'll just say, I see a red apple with you. And to me, that means teacher. And their person will say, yeah, my dad was a teacher. And then my yeah. student feels good. The trust starts to build. And then more comes. So as the student hears, yes, that's right. I can place that. Their vibration lifts. Oh, this is real. I, and I really can do this. The, if the spirit is communicating that apple, their bri- vibration also intensifies. They're getting excited. I'm getting through, yes, right? So that begets more trust. Now, let's say the student sat down and they got the apple and they just wrote down apple and didn't say anything. I'm not sure, I'm gonna need to get more. I don't wanna be wrong. We go all the way through the reading, it's pretty good. And at the end, the sitter says, I'm surprised that you didn't talk about daddy's teaching career. He taught for 45 years and he was so proud of that. I'm sorry, that's too late. You can't now say, well, I drew this apple, see, a long time ago and it means teacher. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's it's also, uh, if you bring it up front, it's also giving you the opportunity to energize the energy match between the two. Exactly. So I think if you you put it away, the energy match, the... The vibrations are lower, the less communication. Trust comes with practice and with releasing the fear of being wrong. And you have a litmus test for whether or not you can trust what's coming in, meaning did it just come in matter of fact? Was it very spontaneous? 
give it. You didn't know where it came from. You know, it's people say you can't make this stuff up, and it's it's like that. You know, you weren't even thinking about what comes in. And sometimes I just I simply know that you have a house in Tahoe. I didn't draw it. I didn't have a symbol. I have a knowing, the clear cognizance. If I if I sit on that and just go, hmm, I got that, but I don't know what 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 what. What happens is the spirit people start to sense, oh, this person's not trusting. Wow. And they get deflated and the whole reading can just go downhill because they're like, there's no energy match here. This is somebody that's not trusting what they're getting. It's not working. Everybody stand down. Spirit world, stand down. This isn't the medium we want. Only, only because that person wouldn't trust and just give what they got. That wow. comes with practice. But they won't, the spirit people will not continue to waste their energy when they feel like they have a medium that's just not tuning in and trusting what they're getting. How did you get past your fears? Uh, you I, had, I had a lot of fears and uh, not just, you know, for one, very few people know that I have this gift other than my family. Um, you know, the fear of judgment, the fear of, sure. you know. Uh, most people are like, oh, I would tell everyone it's so cool. I'm like, just say that and tell it's you. <laughs> so you were, uh, what religion were you? I was raised Methodist, Christian. And are you still? I, I don't I don't uh, go to a church. Sure. Organized religion is wonderful for people. And sure. Can lead but it them. has all these paradigms and these, these, uh, these beliefs, and they're deep-seated, and sometimes... It gets that, in the way it, of God. Yeah, but I think the religions are good, but I think um, it can sometimes become kind of scary, especially Christianity, you know? The... Mm, it's all fire and brimstone. A lot, there's a lot of fire and brimstone. Sure. But when I have connected, when I connect with spirit, I never get that. Yeah. There's no fire and brimstone. There's love and acceptance for everyone. I was afraid people would, I'm afraid I'd be... So you're just afraid of the humans. <laughs> Yes. judgments yes i was and now i don't care so that's interesting and there's a lot of that that happens you know people either think it's fascinating or they think they want to shun you and you know get away from you and i've experienced both i've never i've never worried about what i saw what i heard what i smelled that that is was just in me that felt right okay fear was what other people would think about me fear if i'm wrong fear that i have other people's lives at stake, yeah. Uh, fear a lot of, of giving something yeah. responsibility, fear of saying something that was wrong or that would hurt them. Did you ever think, well, does that mean that I'm going to be inundated with some negative entities at points in time? Did it ever occur to you? No, I I, I say that quite honestly. I, I did not go to fear. I did not go, oh, this is going to be scary. The only time I had fear was when I realized, you just mentioned remote viewing, that I was able to see a scene that had to do with drugs and sex trafficking and... Yeah. And it, Sensitive it, stuff. It felt dark. And this is, I didn't see anything, a crime being committed, but I, I saw something that was related to a real thing. And I thought... That's not the angle I'm going to take. I, I have such respect, respect for mediums that are able to do crime scene work and missing children. I mean, what a gift to be able to, to, to do that. You know, there's negative entities out there. How do you protect yourself from? Every morning we do the golden bubble of protection with the dogs so that we're protected and they're protected. At your house, you and just... And no negative energy is going to come in. Uh -huh. And every night I thank my guides, my loved ones, God, you know, thank you for protecting us every single day. Nice. And because I do that, I have no, no fear of anything negative. I know I'm safe. I live in a rural area. I'm not afraid of anything. Nobody's going to come to my house and do anything. Nobody's going to walk in that door that I never locked. Nobody's going to steal anything because I've asked for the protection. And when I do a sitting, I say, please, only the good come in. If you are not of the light, you can and go And you do away. this daily? Yes, every day. I think doing the protection, um, that really, that feels you, right and so comfortable. You, so you create this protection, this from, bubble around from you. From Suzanne, I go through her 
and then the more I do it, the, I just know it off, off hand. And then sometimes, once again, I'll have that period where I don't do anything, mm -hmm. and then I forget it or whatever. Um, I call in the angels, and I ask. For me, God and Jesus are very important, and they're with me and guiding me. And I don't even I that's. I don't even, even worry about it. It doesn't even come in my mind. One of the biggest impediments to realizing your own natural God-given gift of intuition is fear. I'm afraid I'm going to see something that scares me. I'm afraid I'm going to find out something about the future that I don't want to know. Yeah. I'm afraid that ghosts are going to start waking me up at night. Mm -hmm. This is Hollywood that we're talking about, and it is not real life. As long as you are mostly doing the right thing in your life, you're being a good person, you're trying to treat people how you want to be treated, you're not going to attract anything like that to you. And when you tune in with the intention, give me information that is helpful, hopeful, and healing to help myself, to help my loved ones in my life, and I'm paying attention to the signs and the synchronicities. Mm -hmm. If you're paying attention to the signs and the synchronicities and your intention is you want that helpful information, that's what comes to you, okay? But you have to let go of the fear of, no, if I open up, something bad is gonna happen, or all of a sudden my house will be haunted. I tell you, is there a dark side? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is this tiny, infinitesimal percent of what's really out in the spirit world. When I teach my students grounding, centering, and protection, it is really to protect themselves from the so-called living people's energy because we all carry so much baggage with us. I think even the spirit people sometimes are afraid of that. Oh, I'm gonna bring my energy down there. I've gotta be careful where I go with it. So yeah, releasing the fear is super, super important in knowing that no one is loved more than you. No one is loved. No one is more special than you. You're very special and you are safe. How often do you think it's necessary for you to practice your craft? As much as I can, because I, like I said, there's a lot, uh, a lot of responsibility with it. So you want to be accurate, the, accurate, and and the best information. And the more you practice, it is like a muscle. The more you practice, I've heard that. Yeah. The better it gets. The more you trust, the more symbols you get, mm -hmm. symbolisms, things like that. So, it, it makes a big difference. So I try, just little things, even like sitting there, uh, trying to. What's the next song on the radio going to be? I think practice is important because what it does is it enables someone in this calling to gain confidence. The more you do it, even the more you screw up and, oh, why, why didn't I see, you know, he was showing me this, an umbrella, and I didn't ask for more. Well, okay, then learn from that. And, and that's what development is. So the more you practice, the problem is, is that no two readings are ever going to be the same because no two people are the same, no people in spirit are the same. But what it does is it gives the medium or the psychic or the intuitive the confidence over their fears. So it's just like anything, the more you do something, the more comfortable you are and the more confidence you have. And when you believe in your own confidence, when you believe in yourself, it just gets that much easier. Let me tell you something about that. And Suzanne will laugh when I bring this up. She told me do four or five practice readings. And she said, put it out on her Facebook, her private Facebook group. I did 43. Practice kindness first in your life. Yeah. There is no greater gift that you can give to humankind than to treat others with the compassion that you would like to be treated with. And once you do that, you start receiving compassion from other people. What that does is it charges up all these energy centers. We can talk about chakras all day, but wouldn't you rather just experience that power and that peace that surpasses all understanding? Find places in your life to be of service. I do believe that the divine source uses us right in place where we are. Whether it's just a simple, they talk about random acts of kindness, Look around you and see who needs a smile, who needs a helping hand, who needs someone just to listen and not try to fix it 
for them. That will increase your intuitive abilities because what it does is it wakes up the energy of the body and it says to the body, remember, I'm a spirit being, I'm a soul operating this body right now. And you become more intuitive by monitoring yeah. your thoughts, words, and actions for kindness and compassion. It's not about love. I, I wish it were about love, but let's be realistic. Earth can be a really crappy place for some people. It can be it can be a nirvanic experience and it can be a horrible experience. So let's talk not about loving everybody, but let's talk about having respect for everybody and that does create an intuition. It removes that perceived barrier that we have. Like you and I are separate. We're separate. You've got your problems. I've got mine. No, no. Energetically, we're already connected. So when you have that act of kindness or you accept the act of kindness from someone else, you're plugged into that matrix. You're plugged into that universal consciousness. It isn't about sitting and doing nothing and meditating all day. That's nice. Yeah. But you got to get out there and be the good person you came here to be. What would you suggest for someone just starting out if they want to practice with a, maybe a friend or a loved one? What would you a get friend, on the phone with them? And... A friend or a loved one, or there's a lot of um, people who do developmental development circles online, where it's oh. five or six people. And they're all mediums, and you. Um, do prayer and protection and uh -huh. then you connect you set and meditate and connect and then you can share with each other what you got and it's a it's amazing experience and helps you practice and gives you confidence because i think you know 80 percent of this is confidence and trusting yourself yeah. online private facebook groups the first people i practiced with were the people that i met in suzanne's classes she would partner us together and i've made friends you know with these so, people so you would do sitter uh, i would be the sitter for them then in turn they would be the sitter for me and then i remember asking you know what do i practice on my friends i have done accidental readings for my friends um i have not really practiced on people in my immediate circle even though they know what i do um i have a couple readings scheduled for this week and i'll i'll, I'll do it that way but all of these private Facebook groups that I'm involved in, everyone wants to practice. They're looking for people to be sitters. They're looking you sure. know, to have their own. See, readings. I didn't even know that existed. Oh, it's it's there's a whole online world. Through her Facebook page primarily, and then I had some friends, long-term friends. I didn't know anything about. We did we did mediumship for relatives. I would have no information about it all. And so I did some for some people that I knew as well. But mostly it was people I never met, and some were overseas on her Facebook group and we do them on Skype. Definitely, friends or just even for me, if I would go out for breakfast or lunch or with somebody, I start getting messages. I mean, I would be writing on a napkin, messages in there. And of course, does this apply to you? Yes, yes, yes. Do you encourage your students to maybe connect with friends and in the beginning stages? Absolutely, because it's easiest in the beginning to connect with people here in the living that you already know. And one of the ways that we can do this, and it's a fun exercise that anyone can do, um, is tuning into an aura. With the person who's not even in front of you, they may be somewhere across the country. And I have students that say, I, I never see auras, I wanna see auras. And I tell them, everyone can sense an aura, but not everyone can see okay. an aura, okay. okay? So sense the aura. So I have them write down the first name of someone who is in the living that they're very close to and they know very well. Just write the name down. Now, I'm gonna count three to one, three, two, one, what color comes to mind? And just take the very first color. So let's say they write down blue. <laughs> and they say, okay, now take a white light shower, let that go. Write down a name of another person. What color comes to mind? Okay, take a white light shower and let that go. Now, look at your colors. Do you know what they mean? No, no clue. I don't know anything about aura colors. Okay, well blue, just as an example, has to do with the throat chakra or this throat energy center, which is about expressing oneself, 
clear, accurate healing communication, speaking the truth. Um, singers will have a very pronounced um, blue throat chakra. You have an extremely pronounced blue throat chakra um, because you're a very good communicator. So I see now, how does that fit with your loved one? Like, oh my God, oh my God, it nails them. It's amazing. And um, congratulations, you just sensed the aura. Do you encourage your students to meet with other aspiring psychic mediums, communicate? Do you, do you encourage this communication? Yes. Regardless of whether someone is learning to connect just for themselves, they don't want to be professional, or they do, it doesn't matter. In mediumship, the development circle is very important. I sat in a development circle for years before I ever sat with a student. And in the circle, you have different exercises and practices that you can do. Sometimes you tune in and you do inspired address, meaning that you'll have a spirit person come and give an uplifting talk through you and you blend your personality with theirs. There's so many experiences that you can have in a group and everyone holds the space. They meet at the same time every week and the energy keeps going up. Um, this is something, especially in the United States, that is very lacking. Yeah. where people can't find the circles. So the good news is we now have technology where you can do this online. And I can tell you from experience, it works just as well meeting in an online room as it does meeting in the physical space. Now it's more fun to sit together in of the course, physical yeah. space. You, you can't beat that. But in a true circle, you're not, you shouldn't be hanging out with each other and telling each other everything because then when you get messages in the circle, you don't know, oh, did I hear that at lunch last Tuesday? Or did I pick this up in the circle? So a true development circle, um, you just come together during that uh, period of time every week and you don't share outside. So that's one way. Now another way is to find one or two students that you do become buddies with. They're not in your circle but you can share experiences and you can just call them up and go, hey, I had this weird thing. Does this ever happen to you? It gives you a validation that you're not crazy, that everybody's having their own unique experiences and you can bond so that later on when you do need a friend or someone to turn to, they understand. We get to feel so isolated sometimes, especially we professional mediums. It's like we work in our own silo. And I know that if I didn't have um, a couple of really trusted friends that do this, I would be a very lonely person. Yeah. Um, fortunately, I teach more now, um, but I, I, I try to not become real good buddies um, with the students because I want to have them to think of me as a resource and not someone that they have to impress. As you're going through this, sometimes you will lose friendships. You will have relatives reject you. Yeah. And I want my students to be able to bring me that as well or bring that to the class as well. You know, why is this happening? And less and less of this is going on now. But I remember even yeah. 10 years ago, yeah. people saying, you know, my parents say you're dead to me because you're now doing this woo-woo class and things like that. So a lot of things change in a person's life when they embrace the intuitive life. You can do it in a very quiet way if, it's, if you're just using it for yourself. And, and just let your light shine through and people will say, there's something different about you. I don't know, is it your hair? Or you just seem, no, you seem happier. And be a, be a representative of the spiritual way. And at some point, if they say, no, really tell me, what's changed with you? And, and then you, you, you can just gut level check it, should I tell them? Okay, I'm trusting my intuitive voice more. Yeah. I'm talking to God more. I'm talking to my team more. Oh, what's a spiritual team? <laughs> if they just shut down and say, oh, righty, Fine, let that be. A teacher of mine said a long time ago, Suzanne, 
it seems like every soul has the same 1,000 lessons to experience over many lifetimes. You do not know if the person right in front of you is on lesson 995 or 33. Okay. Let that be okay. Be an ambassador for spirituality simply by how you handle yourself and the calm and the peace that you have and the fact that no matter what happens to you, you're unflappable. You can be upset for a little while because you're in the human experience and there's things to be upset about, but not for very long because you can come back to center by remembering the spirit that's within you. I'd like to talk about your your vibration, mm -hmm. you know, the frequency of your vibration. What do you do to keep it, let's say, high, high vibration? It's interesting because until probably the last two years, I didn't understand that. What I'm like, what do they mean by that? <laughs> I keep your high. Now I know. Like, you you stay positive and you try to keep... When, when I see something or something happens or and I start to judge, I stop myself. It's, it gets slower. Zzzt. Oh, it stops. I stop myself because it will slow your vibration down. Oh, so you won't let that even enter your no. mind. You know how to shut it down. Yeah. Like so what, you, what are you, you judging those people for? If you're judging them, then wow. you're not loving them. So you need to stop that. Wow. And it's been a lot of, of educating... And, and soul searching in yourself and making yourself a better person. Yeah. When you don't have good thoughts, when you're not positive, it lowers your vibration greatly. And your abilities start to... You get really muddy. It's difficult. That's, again, I, I know I, I sound like a broken record, but that's sitting in the power. Sitting in the power for me is the best and most powerful way to raise my own vibration. Because what I used to do, and when I did a lot of these guided meditations, I would picture my crown chakra opening and light from the divine pouring in and as if that was how I was getting my energy, was from the light from the divine. But then I had something come to me in a meditation and I, there were three things. The light of the divine is within me. The light of the divine shines through me. I am the light. I had written that down after a meditation. I can't say it's one thing. I think it's a lot of things, but the main things, I was thinking about this on the drive down today, the main things have been about getting extricating people from my life who are toxic for me because that just does not help my frequency at all. Certain places in Sedona that I go to that the frequency is high and I'll go there regularly and spend some time because I always feel so highly energized when I leave there. So all of these things, being around other people who are light workers who are high frequency, keeps your frequency up too. Raising the vibration would in involve doing the meditation, watching programs that are spiritual, reading books that are spiritual, watching my diet. If I'm going to do a reading, I need to really clear my system, my body, watch what I eat, don't drink alcohol. How do you raise, how do you get your students to raise their vibration? I think we need to tell people what that means. Okay. First off, there's an assumption everybody knows what it means to raise your vibe. Play some happy music, have people dance, um, have people meditate, have people focus on something that's a happy memory. That's all well and good, but tell them why they're doing it. We need to separate ourselves from that density of the earth in all of the muck that's here. I call it spiritual dust bunnies. You know, um, someone's left their anger in the office. Um, someone's left their worries over here and it, it's, it's in the field. I have had people come up after a, a weekend conference and say, this is great. I know we were raising our vibration. I feel really good right now. I'm gonna to try to hang on to this feeling. But what did I really do by raising my vibration? What does that really mean? And what it means is transcending the human experience, transcending all of the, um, the, the needs, the wants, the desires for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's about a true focus of being in the here and the now and being very wide-eyed to look around yourself and experience the energies of those that are around you to the point where you can feel compassion for everyone in that room, everyone that you see. I have these days where I'm in the grocery store and I can just look at someone I've never met before 
and my heart feels like it's going to explode. I feel so much compassion for that person. And that's how I know that my vibration is not in the heavy, dense earth of me, me, me. I got to get my stuff done. I've got to cut in line. I've got to, you know, weave in out of traffic to save two minutes or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm going to slow down and I'm going to actually experience each individual. And I'll even think about their story. I wonder what his story is. And in that moment, I don't need to know anything about that stranger except that they're connected to me. That's the raising of the vibration. Everybody's different. I know people that dance to um, rock music to raise their vibe. I know people that are like, no, no, no. Um, I wanna play an, an old classic song and I need to be quiet to raise my vibration. It's all about escaping the worries about tomorrow through a natural and healthy spiritual way. Did you ever uh, do a reality check on your ethics? I have. I've been, you know, trained through Suzanne Wilson, so that's been part of her training the whole time. Always is ethics, and we've been trained, you know, to be helpful, hopeful, and healing. If it's not helpful, hopeful, and healing, we shouldn't be doing it. This is nothing to take lightly. Like, oh, how fun! I mean, you think, oh, it's you know, Madame Ouija boards. Too, so yeah, Ouija boards in the big crystal ball. I'm gonna have my hair in a in a big um, silk scarf. The biggest thing I learned early on is it, it is not my, in fact, it is my responsibility not to share everything that I hear. I am only to share the information that I'm given that is to help your greater good. My husband is kind of with it and kind of not, and it's scary for him. Mm -hmm. So that's a great reality check for me because not everybody believes, not everybody understands it, not everybody wants to know. So right. for, in my mind, you don't just blurt out what you see and say and do. And I also learned something from Suzanne what, that really stuck with me and was important. That she said, even, Lori, even if you're seeing some bad things or, yeah. you know, people say, am I going to have a car accident or whatever, or watch those tires. I don't get any of that stuff. And I think partly because when I was learning from Suzanne years ago, she said, that's not your, you're not God. It's not your business to tell people that stuff mm -hmm. because of free will that can change at any minute. So what you're really doing is worrying people. Do you have, do you have an ethics? The ethics are important, whether you're going to be a practicing uh, intuitive, a practicing medium, or you just have skills. Mm -hmm. You need to know. When, your own ethics. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's all about integrity. I always go back to that test of, is this information helpful, hopeful, and healing? Is this person open to receiving the information? I ask my students, do not snipe or attack anybody, no matter how good the news is that you think you have, uh, if you don't even know them. Because that's the ego. It, it is. I want to show that I got this, yeah. how right I am, and then I won't let the person go because I want to keep giving them information and keep going and keep going. And then meanwhile, they're looking like, get me out of here. What works best for me, and I have, have my students start with this, is only have the first name of the person. Meditate 10 minutes before on that first name. Invite the spirit team to come in and get to know you. Tell them how you work, which I call my rules of engagement for spirit. Mm -hmm. and they must be from the light. They must have that sitter's best interest at heart. I'm able now, I'm at a point in my life where people come to me knowing how this works, knowing that I can't just produce, you know, the winning lottery tickets and things like that, knowing that I won't tell them if their husband's cheating on them or whatever. The spirit world, frankly, doesn't care. You should work that out yourself. I mean, I, my clients come with... Um, very professional expectations because they've been in my classes, they've been in my workshops, whatever. My students don't have that luxury. So I've got to bring up all the experiences I've had over the years and share my own mistakes yeah. with them so they can learn from them. Will they still make mistakes? Yes. Same ones? Maybe. Maybe not because they heard from me. But at the end of the day, what they know is they're getting better they're getting stronger, and they're always throughout being of service of, to spirit. And that's what this is. This is being of service to spirit. If that is kept first and foremost, here and here, service mm -hmm. to spirit, 
ethics will follow along perfectly. How you open it and shut it and down. close it. So I, it took a while because I, I suffered from anxiety, a, a severe anxiety, a lot of my life until I was able to get a grip on this because I thought, you know, it was, uh, it was overwhelming. Yeah. There were times in crowds or at concerts, and I'm like, I gotta leave. I can't do this. It, it just became too much. Sure. So. I need a break. What do you do to shut it down? That's why I just ask now. You just put the clothes sign. Yep. Well, you used to. I don't even have to do that anymore, but yes, that and was they, my tool. And before. they immediately just. They know. They respect that. All right, do you ever instruct your students to open and close? Yes. Each student can find his or her own way of tuning in and tuning out. It can be as simple as the ages-old tradition of visualizing that you're sitting in your reading room and you've turned on the neon sign. The intuitive is in. And then at the end of the day, you turn it out. The intuitive is closed. Uh, some people like to sweep up to open, sweep down, to rebalance. You're not really closing, but you're rebalancing with the intention that I'm open just the right amount for me. But rituals are very important because they seem to multiply and intensify the intention. So I can open up quick, I can close down quick, but once I've done it, it's done. That's it. I notice if I forget to do it, and students will tell me they know if they forget to do it, they go out and it's like bright lights are shining on them in a spiritual sense. It's like, uh, it's like coming out of a, a movie theater and all of a sudden everything's too bright or too sensitive. I'm like, yeah, you maybe need a white light shower and do something to close yourself down. Um, but it can be very, very fast. Uh, we don't have to go sprinkling holy water and lighting sage and all that sort of stuff. You just have an intention. How do you uh, teach your, your students to protect themselves? I have a protection bubble that I use myself, and you can use any color that you want. It's an intentional prayer okay. or uh, words that you say, if you don't want to call it a prayer, that I'm in a beautiful golden bubble of protection that's mm -hmm. bathed in divine white light to seal in all positive energies, to seal out all energies that do not belong, so that in this space, only messages of peace, love, protection, harmony may enter in. Yeah. And some people like to just envision themselves sitting in a cone of light or a ray of light or grounding cords. I just saw a big white flash that I saw objectively right beside your shoulder right now. So somebody's grooving on this right now, which is kind of cool. But anything that you use every single day is good for that whole day until you, the night you've slept and the new sun comes up. So if you oh, just think okay. about it this way, if you did it, in the morning, if you yeah. did something quick for grounding, centering, protection in the morning before you get up, it's good the whole day. You know, I think this is good for everybody. Even if you don't mm -hmm. want to develop your psychic uh, abilities. I think it's just good for everybody. Just because the earth has got some negative stuff going on. And you're going to be in a room and you're going, oh, wow. Yeah. I have a Baptist minister friend who used to say, Suzanne, this is hell. And he meant earth. Yeah. He meant this is the lower vibrational yeah, I to agree place. I, I, I believe that there are places that are of even lower <laughs> vibration. I'm glad we're not there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're really protecting yourself from the energies of the so-called living. You know, I, I'm sure that the students always are second guessing. What do you, how do you encourage them to say, hey, let's talk about second guessing yourself. Start to notice how many times you were right when you went with the first thing that came in and celebrate those. And then you get so busy celebrating, yes, I trusted the very first thing that came in and it was right. Eventually you stop questioning every single thing. Now you've created a new pattern, a new energy pattern of, yes, I went with the first thing and it was right. And it just starts to go away. Do you still have those days where you just feel yeah. off, I'm not tuned in? I think that's part of the human experience too. Please let that be okay. Yeah. Because tomorrow's a new day. You know, I've, I've read a lot about uh, symbology and I've heard a lot of the, you know, students talk about they, they dig the symbology as a way of, you know, a tool like the apple. How do you encourage the, uh, 
the vocabulary or the symbology to enter into it. The students who take the mediumship mentoring with me keep their own dictionary of symbols. The, the spirit people and your guides, they don't have a voice box, they don't have a mouth, they have an etheric body that functions differently from ours. It's yeah. said to be a wonderful feeling because nothing goes wrong with their bodies. So they have to find a dif different way to communicate with you. How about psych psychometry? Do you? Yes, hold? psychometry is fun, especially in the live classes yeah. where I can get a whole bunch of different objects for people. You know, they're really good at it. And people are, are at first very nervous. I'm like, nope, just yell out and have a person taking notes for everything they say so they can just focus on what they're feeling. But it's really good because everybody leaves an energetic impression on an object. Sure. And it's one of the easiest and first ways to build your confidence is to sense the energy on the object. If you can find someone who will arrange an object from somebody you don't know, the tricky part is somebody you kind of know or you've been sitting in the workshop with all weekend and you've talked and you know what they're like, da, da, da. they told you what they do for a living, they told you that, and then the teacher says, now trade with the person you're sitting next to. And you're like, well, I already know this, I already know this, I already know that, I'm having a hard time turning my mind off. So it's better if you can trade with somebody you haven't spoken to that weekend, you don't know anything about, and the mind is more free it's like, psh, there's no pressure here. Nobody's grading me. I'm just going to tell you what I pick up. And it's, a, it's great as an early confidence builder. Do you ever tell your students to visit antique stores or anything just to kind of get a... I'm afraid they might be overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. In fact, I've had experiences there where somebody followed me in spirit out to my car. I'm like, no, I didn't buy that thing. You just go back, go back. If You know what? It's not a bad idea, though. It's not a bad idea, but you'd need somebody there to be uh, able to validate what you receive. I'll tell you a story. Uh, we, were, uh, we were in the Warner Brothers prop room, Lacey and I, and those props were speaking to me. They could talk. Yeah, they're chandeliers. I mean, we're talking from the 30s. Oh, my. They were, this chandelier was in this movie. That armoire was in that movie. And there were yeah. so many different things. Yeah. I was just like... What about, uh, do you ever uh, talk about remote viewing in your, in your class? Yes, we've done several remote viewing exercises. And it's interesting because it's, it seems like it's always the person that says, I can't do this, I don't want to do this, that does really, really well. Um, but we, we use um, the scientific remote viewing methods, just the basics of determining, you know, is this uh, man-made um, or organic? Is, is there um, a biological, meaning a person or an animal? And then probing, we teach probing, where they can start to tune into, is this um, structure or whatever it is, hard, soft, semi-hard, semi-soft. And then um, we do a little bit of the work with the symbols. Now, am I a remote viewing teacher? No, but I think what the remote viewing community has done is they've put so many free resources out on the web that anyone who wants to just try some of the beginnings of this will, will be amazed at, at what they can do. So I would assume that you encourage your students to journal their progression. It's a must. Yeah. And that the students will fight me on the journaling and go, oh, really? So much work. And I want to write it down. It's like, I have um, a woman who has studied for many, many years, and she has, like me, tons of journals, and she's gone through and she's color coded, and now she's able to use it to write a book about her evolutionary process and teach herself. Now, it doesn't have to be that detailed, but it's so nice to go back and see when when did that happen, and exactly what happened, because the mind will play tricks on you. 
your mind over time will either exaggerate an experience or dismiss the experience. So the sooner you write things down, the better. Do you have any like basic principles of success that you tell your students? Only work with your intuitive abilities when you feel like it. Okay. If you're depressed, if you don't feel well, if you're coming to it with a, a bad attitude that day, and we all have those days, sure. just set it aside. Tell your team, look team, I'm having a bad day and I'm just asking for blessings. I'm asking yeah. any of the angelic realm that's around me to give me blessings. So that's the first thing. When you approach your spiritual work, do so in the right frame of mind. Don't ask for information you don't really wanna know or information that's not any of your business. So when we program our pendulums or cards or whatever we're doing in a class, I just, I tell the students, look, if, if it's none of your business, don't even ask, you shouldn't go there. Lately I've been hearing, am I ever going to be a grandmother? Is my daughter gonna meet someone? Is my son gonna meet someone? Is their marriage, that's their business. Mm -hmm. What the spirit world wants from you is they want you to ask, how can I best support my loved one through whatever they're going through? You know, how can I best be of service to that loved one? Not yeah. how can I get them married off and pregnant? You know, um, focus on you yeah. is, is the main thing. A lot of us go through life often questioning many different things. Are we on the right path? Are we doing the right thing? Or are we wanting to know the whereabouts of a deceased loved one? But I think the question you need to ask yourself is, do you want to improve on your intuitive abilities? Will it help you in life? Will it help others? Will it help you in the afterlife? I am convinced, and I'm sure you agree, that we all could improve our connection with spirit if we make a conscious effort to do the work.